Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for the wonderful op thank you the wonderful opportunity to be here in Taiwan again with many very very uh, distinguished and very engaged colleagues. It's really a pleasure to have the chance to learn from you and more importantly to learn with you. And what I want to talk about today is something that isn't written yet, if you will. It's something that's going to evolve, that is evolving, will evolve, and what we really need, ah, thank you, what we really need in this, and being in a university is a very good place to think about this, that we don't have solutions to sustainability. We don't even know what it is, in essence. We can't say, well, we just do this and then we're sustainable. We will have to be a society that continues to learn together. And I emphasize the together, the diversity of humanity is crucial in this because otherwise we don't have neither the expertise nor the creativity that we need to be able to keep moving and keep adapting and changing in order to create our own sustainable futures in the many contexts and cultures of the world. So my concern here is what I just said. How do we basically learn and create our way forward? But the immediate context um, is to give a, a couple of key points here. One of them is that society is bound up with the environment. It's not separate. When I sometimes talk to people, oh, yes, the ecosystem, that's the forest over there. And I say, yes, and what are you breathing? What are you drinking? What are you wearing? We are in the middle of it. We cannot be separate from it. And societies, each society, different cultures define themselves what is important, what is valuable, what is relevant, in relationship to the both local and global environment. And sustainability then fundamentally depends on how people conceive of their relationship to the environment and therefore their sense of agency and responsibility. By agency I mean their ability to do something, to act. And the responsibility, it's sort of can I do something? Should I do something? And those two together are crucial. And for the well-being and perhaps the survival of humanity in this very rapid change that we're not used to the change on many levels, not just climate change, but changes in movement of people in changes in the economic situation, changes in the political situation. These are all happening very quickly. So we, as I said earlier, we must learn our way forward. We don't have a manual, a textbook that says, oh, just do this, 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 and then we're all fine. So the challenge, in my view, is really changing human behavior, not First, the environment, because it is the humans in the Anthropocene era that have changed the environment into the conditions in which we now live. So it is a very difficult task, and one that we just had a wonderful symposium here at NTU in the Risk Society Policy Research Center um, on sustainability from the point of view of the changes in society that the social dynamics needed to make transitions. I'm going to use the World in 2050 report that I was involved in writing um, with a group of colleagues from the, uh, inst from the Institute, International Institute for Advanced Systems Analysis, got it, IASA, uh, in near Vienna, Austria, and the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, 
And it was an effort to ask if we look from today through the Sustainable Development Goals in 2030, where do we end up in 2050? Or actually, it became a, the reverse. If we want to be here in 2050, what do we have to do? What kind of trajectory do we need to follow to get to where we want to be in 2050? So the, the main things were to talk about human capacity and demography, populations, consumption, production, decarbonization and energy, food, biosphere, water, the nexus, smart cities, and the topic of today's uh, symposium, the digital revolution. What came out of this also was a set of procedures, a process, a five-step process, which I'm not going to go into here. It's in the report. The report was submitted to the UN uh, at the high-level policy forum in July of this year, so just a couple of months ago. Um, I want to focus on a couple of important things, again, coming to the question of digitalization. And let me make a general statement from my perspective. Yes, it is about digitaliza digitalization and the digital economy, the digital revolution, if you will, but I think that that may be a little misleading. It's not only about big data. Everybody talks about big data. Okay, yes, fine, that's true. But so much of this really depends on computational power. And that will not only be digital, it will be quantum driven in the near future, I believe. I don't know what near means. Is that five years or 10 years? But it doesn't matter. But the real point is that the computational power is what allows us to use the digital data. We couldn't do it with the complexity that we're dealing with. We couldn't deal with the complexity of sustainability without some of that computational power. So innovation and in science in technology that drive this kind of innovation must somehow get better aligned with sustainability, with the goals that we have in order to su support society. One of the things that would be, has been very apparent to me, I started and ran a company for 18 years in Silicon Valley, and there's a lot of interest in innovation. It's the big hub of innovation, or was. The problem is that it's all driven by market and not by societal needs. We need to bring those together better if we're going to make good use of the science and technology. So some quotes from the report um, was the digital revolution symbolizes the conversions of innovative technologies, many of which are currently ambivalent in their contribution to sustainable development, simultaneously supporting sustainability, but also threatening it. And we will come to more examples of that in a moment. So it's important to bring these together if we're going to really deal with the 2030 SDG agenda, however that is conceived in different locations, and to create forward-looking roadmaps that really allow us to move in some constructive direction, and particularly with regard to the impact on workplace, social cohesion, the structures of communities, and human dignity. So there were several things, and it, all of this, I mean, I, I urge you to look at the, um, the report. It is available online. Um, I, can, I don't think I wrote down the right uh, URL, but I can certainly provide that. Um, but the, some of the key points were uh, enabling infrastructure so that there is really much more equitable distribution of computational access and data. Um, online services, there are a number of those which we know, things like online finance, but also the questions of regulatory me measures for online identity 
pr protection and privacy, um, and national systems or platforms for healthcare and for education. And I'll come back to that a bit more later. And the important thing, and that is, if you will, a very positive aspect, is that with the Internet of Things and smart grids as some examples, there's a potential, and I emphasize it's still a potential, to be more efficient in the use of resources and better in terms of being able to distribute resources to where they are needed on a much more on a much finer grained grid than is currently possible. Income redistribution to address inequalities, that comes up because the digital access is not uniform. People have mobile phones in many places in low income areas, but whether in fact they have control of their data and they have privacy is a different question. And that is not equally distributed. There needs to be issues about tax and regulatory systems to avoid the monopolization, the capture of the system by very large companies. I won't name them, but you can guess. And that is certainly in the United States, where I'm originally from, uh, a major issue right now. And uh, Google and Facebook and others have been called to testify in Congress because of concerns about privacy and about the fact that they control not very clearly, I mean transparently, so much compu computational power and m material. So there's also questions of things like biotech, nanotech, AI, artificial intelligence, and a, also a, certainly a big issue around autonomous vehicles, autonomous systems, not just cars, but drones and other uh, means of transportation, for example, and robots in the factory. So the idea of how do we get to much more high quality, low cost, broadband means of distributing this enormous capacity. And I think that education, but I would say not just in the university, but from preschool, kindergarten, all the way through is a big piece of this. We need to change the way that happens so that when you get, when somebody comes to the university, it isn't like, oh, now we'll talk about these things. No, we can start talking about and explaining and more importantly demonstrating sustainable directions and digitalization in a constructive way from very early on. And I could talk more about that, but don't have time now. But again, it's also about taking emerging, not just what exists, but what begins to emerge of digital technologies and infrastructure and matching them with the nature of human societies and the norms in different societies. We are not, we, we are hopefully working together across the globe but we also have our own cultures, our own particular concerns, our own contexts that we need to be aware of in the differences that we develop. So some implications I've already mentioned that this huge capacity to store data from multiple sources and in different forms, so analog and digital data, or if you will, uh, um, discrete or um, quantitative data and qualitative data. Um, the computational and increasing speed of that and power. And just a quick note, the artificial intelligence, I sometimes think that that's a little bit misleading also because it's really about using various human designed algorithms and building on that, expanding on that in an adaptive process. And yes, we can call it artificial intelligence, but we also have to remember that 
it's humans who set this up and it has human flaws in it as well as operational, mathematical, and other challenges that can come up. Quantum development, quantum computing, I think is on the horizon. It isn't there yet for a number of reasons, but we should not ignore that that also will have an impact as that becomes accessible. The other point that I want to make is that it's not just about gathering big data and getting statistical averages because you lose an awful lot of important information. One of the reasons that Sandra von der Leyen at Arizona State and I and uh, several other people really pushed back on the integrated assessment modeling is that society is changing so rapidly in so many ways in so many different places that the idea of doing integrated assessment modeling with a single indicator for education, for health, for uh, demographics, for the migration or whatever, from today to 2050 doesn't make a lot of sense because in two years, maybe in two months, many things will have changed as we have already seen. So we need to think about the social science and about the narratives and the ways in which people express their both vision but their sense of identity and how that motivates them to act or to say, no, not me, I don't want to do that. So we need to go beyond generalizations. We need to look much more in detail. And so the concentration of com computer power and information processing is a serious threat in one sense because of concentration of that power, but it also allows us maybe to be much more careful about how we understand. It gives us insight in principle, and we need to make use of that. There are obviously the negative effects directly, but also difficulties in accountability and oversight, and we don't have the mechanism in place for that in most places, I would say. Obviously, cyber crime, cyber warfare are serious issues in this, and privacy, and also you have lots of data. question is where to come from. How do you know where the data come, came from? We talk about fake news, yeah, well, you can dump anything you want on the internet, basically. And so how do we begin to verify what we use? Let me go on, oh, sorry, I, I skipped the online education is potentially a very powerful and very helpful thing. Citizen science, the capacity to actually contribute to things in science, and assisted living, ways of improving people's well-being throughout their lives. And by the way, with the education also, it's not about going up to the university and then you stop learning. I mean, some of us actually learn after that, I keep discovering. So the point is it's lifelong learning I meant with that. So there are difficulties like the flood of data and social ma media makes it very difficult to distinguish signals from noise. There's all this stuff out there. How do you know what's valid, what's real, what's not? How do you find what you need? You can search for it, but the question is what does the search, ba what is the search based on? What does it bring back to you? Um, it's difficult again, well, the, the result, by the way, then is the polarization of populations and that people only listen to what they want to hear, so the confirmation bias. And it's difficult to also to defend against deliberate efforts to inject that bias. Maybe quite fundamentally is most of society who do, who do not have access to this kind of power can't process as a society the flood of information and the change. We just don't have the means to do that on an everyday basis. So that also is an issue of concentration of power and we need to find ways to deal with that. So the digital computational elite have access and tools 
that allow to them both to innovate and market, but we need to understand and have the transparency to know that that is actually for our, to, for our general, for the well-being of the society. I'm going to jump ahead and in the last bit here, I want to talk a little bit about creativity and what I mentioned earlier, we need to bring people together to have dialogues, to communicate about science, about society. And when I say science, I mean social science, natural science, society. It's, a, it's the whole spectrum, humanities, law, history, ethics. All of those are Im very important. And I urge very often in working particularly with colleagues and with teachers, that the issue is not handing over information. People can get all kinds of information. They, the question is, how do you stimulate their questions so they know what it is really they want to learn about and to help them own their understanding and their learning? And so I think the point is, how do we develop tools, improve tools, not develop them, but improve them? OK, thank you. Um, uh, for thinking both individually and collaboratively. How do we learn to collaborate well? Um, how do we stimulate and expand opportunities for creative ideation, thinking, um, with diverse populations? People of very different knowledge and ways of thinking about the world. Um, and we need to make use of that and include them, not exclude them because we're quote, experts. I, I think the point is not the expertise. It's the willingness to, to think together and to bring different knowledge together into things. And develop digital experiences that can enhance empathy for others, for example, rather than excluding them. And I'll give you an example in a moment. And to be able to explore and e experiment with simulation of complex systems. We're dealing with complex systems but it's not easy to think about them because causality is not in the norm, in the way we use, are used to think about, well, here's something I'm going to do, and then there's the, the effect, and I can see that. Well, in a very complex system, that effect may take place far away and in a very different time frame. And so we may not see the impact of our actions. Um, let's see here, wait a minute. And so I want to very, very briefly at the end here give you a couple of crazy ideas about games. Um, because I think those are part of the way that we can use the digital as a friend, not a foe, if we design that well. Because it can engage people. It can be a boundary object for opening dialogues. Not for providing information, but allowing people from very different perspectives to begin to discuss because you're dealing with this sort of external object rather than face to face and uh, arguing with each other. We can do things like a game that I'm, I have designed and we've prototyped Gaming the Future using augmented reality to see the consequences you don't see in the immediate action but that do happen in the future landscapes. It's sort of what I consider a simple way to understand complexity, even though that sounds kind of silly. And I'm also working now on a long-term project on a multiplayer online role-playing game based on stories of sustainable futures to really be a way of engaging people of all ages. Um, I'll, I don't have time to go through this, but one truck that uh, Ordwin Wren and myself designed uh, that's traveling around, was traveling around Germany, reached 700,000 people over the last few years that was about the energy transition, and in the middle of which was a game that was not designed to teach. It was designed to stimulate questions, to say, get people to say, wait, wait a minute, what? What happened? What, why did that happen? And begin talking to each other about it, not to me. And the last thing I mentioned, the gaming the future,
Here's a Lego board. Imagine a Lego board in front of me here, just a big table. And you can build a landscape. And you can have um, a power source here, a hydro dam, let's say. You have a, a factory here. You have a city here. You have some roads. You have agricultural fields. And you have a river. Great. Now, that would be very simple. And everybody can, does that. People know Legos. Um, but we did a prototype in, a, uh, in Rome about a year ago and called it Crayon City as a prototype. I don't know how well you can see the, fo the pictures, but we had adults and children playing with this. And when you put something on the table, you not only see an image, which is like a satellite observation, geosynchronous orbit, but you also see the CO2 output of your landscape, the air pollution, the river pollution, the river flow, the traffic density, the energy consumption, what are all kinds of things you can show. Thank you. I am done just about. Um, and this was done through a grant from both the Lego Foundation and the Templeton Foundation. And part of the goal was to understand collective creativity. It's not just what's in our head as creative individuals, all of us in different ways, but how do we expand that? What Stuart Kaufman, talking about evolutionary biology in the 1970s, talked about the adjacent possible. And we came up with the idea that this is actually what we need in creativity, is to be able to work together so that we can expand the space of the adjacent possible and therefore be creative in a collaborative way through society which are diverse and which have different knowledge and different ways of looking at the world. And out of that, we can keep learning and creating and innovating to keep our societies in a state of well-being, we hope. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, OK. Please identify yourself. Um, my name is Manasseh. I'm from the Department of Climate Change and Sustainable Development of College Social Science. No, College of uh, Science. So my question is this. Um, how can we talk about the pathway toward sustainable futures when we know that there is another part of the world we left behind? For example, uh, in some countries, there is a problem like uh, of education. So for example, some little girls, they, they, they tend to leave school healthy, and also they tend to be many children. And uh, uh, another problem of the decarbonization and energy, if we take, for example, United States and China, they represent for themselves like 40% of the total greenhouse gas emissions, like the CO2, for example. So how can we achieve the sustainable I like the sustainability that we are talking. It's a very important, very good question. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I think the point is that there are, one has to be careful in looking at the way this is framed, and it's pathways, plural. So I don't think there is a pathway that we kind of somehow magically all go towards. What I think is that these concerns that you bring up with education, with gender equality. Um, there are many, many of these issues. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, have many targets in that sense. But how they are fulfilled by in local, different locations and different cultures, different contexts, means that we have to be able to find things that are relevant and credible in that context. And not so you can't just import it, say, this is the global direction, and we'll just use that. So I think the challenge is for the, each of these 
different areas, different regions, um, to find effective strategies to move forward. We have a project at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam that is looking at global uh, sustainability strategies. It's called the Global Sustainability Strategy Forum, where we will bring together people from uh, regions all over the world to look at it in a regional basis and see what is working, what isn't. And we will sort of do this every couple of years. And that helps us think about these different contexts and different pathways. Very good. So uh, probably we will stop here and uh, move to the next. And uh, can we uh, give uh, a prose to uh, Iran again? Thank you. Thank you.